Demon. This is the longest book you'll ever read. <laughs> 25 verses. <laughs> now, because of that, yeah, because of that, you could read it in, you know, just a few minutes. It's it's a great book, you know. You breeze right through that and tell everybody you wrote a, read a whole book of the Bible. <laughs> Philemon, this is not actually who the book is about. It's a letter written to this man. And it's a letter written to him about his slave that ran away. <laughs> Philemon himself was a resident of Colossae and probably a convert of Paul when he was in Ephesus. Uh, Philemon's house was large enough that it was big enough for the church meeting. That's where they had church, was at his house. In, uh, in uh, chapter 1, well, there's only one chapter, but look at verse 2. <laughs> He says, and to our beloved Epaphra and Archippus, our fellow soldiers, and to the church in thy house. So he said, he's writing to him and he's saying, I remember when I was there, you got this person over there and that person over there. And uh, instead of me naming them all, everybody that's in your house, <laughs> everybody that meets there. Now that's the way the church used to meet. It started out in somebody's house, and then it would grow until it was too big for a house. And then they'd get, like Paul had an upper room that he preached in one time. Uh, they Well, originally they started out going to synagogues, and then they got kicked out of there real quick. <laughs> and then they, now I think things are going to go back to that. The, it seems like the Holy Spirit runs in a circuit. And, and what you'll see is that the churches will disappear at some point. And or they'll be outlawed or like they've been trying to do here lately shut them down and it'll be people going back to meeting in houses and you know little groups and that's fine that's, that's either way is fine it's not supposed to be about big buildings anyway it's supposed to be about people <laughs> and wherever you get together that's a church doesn't matter what it, what the meeting house looks like uh, he was this man was generous to the other believers there and his son, Archippus, evidently held the position of leadership in the church. Um, in verse 5, he says, Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brother so he says uh, i'm excited to talk about you and to write to you everybody's excited when they've heard about you because you've been a real help to everyone and that's a good thing paul is very gracious <laughs> in most of his letters until he gets on a problem that somebody has and then he doesn't hold back but just as a normal person in everyday life, that's the way we should be, as nice and polite as we can be. And that's what he's doing here. In Colossians, look at chapter 4, Colossians 4. You see this, this church leader, Archippus. Colossians 4, verse 17. And say to Archippus... Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. So Archippus is probably the, the pastor, the preacher, or whoever's leading the group here. And they're meeting in uh, Philemon's house. Um, Philemon uh, may have had other slaves. He's probably got a big household because he's having people over to meet there. And usually in this day and age, they didn't just have one slave. Now, he may have had a... Uh, this time when they had these manservants, somebody that would help you get dressed and pick your clothes out. I couldn't stand that. <laughs> Don't tell me what to wear. I can put my own shirt on, thank you. <laughs> but back in the day, that's what they did. So he probably had multiple servants here. Obviously, um, he's been gone for a while so either he's replaced him or there's been enough other people that they can pick up the slack for him um, Colossians 4 look at verse 1 masters give unto your servants that which is just and equal knowing that ye also have a master in heaven now this is a 
I just try to stay right with what the Bible says instead of what I like and what I feel and uh, what I want to say because that's going to be wrong. Let's just go exactly with what the Bible says. He didn't say, you people that have servants, get rid of them. It's not right to have servants. He didn't. He said, you masters, make sure you're treating the servant correctly. God doesn't condemn the master-servant relationship. As a matter of fact, he tells you how to do it properly. Even in the millennium, all of Israel is going to enslave all of the nations that enslaved them. That's a promise that they have. So God is okay with the master-servant relationship as long as it's done properly. Now, you can't mistreat them. And they've got to be treated correctly and in fact, in the Old Testament, the rule was this. If you don't treat your servant well enough that he does not want to run, that's your fault. If he runs, you cannot go get him. If he leaves, that's your fault. You just lost out. You can't go get him. And that's one thing that's going to be interesting about this book because that's exactly what this guy does. He leaves. Now, so this master, uh, Philemon, probably needed... A little reminding, hey, as a master, you're supposed to be treating your servants so they don't want to leave. <laughs> now, at the same time, you've got to remember there's human nature that kicks in. And some people want to leave because they want to put something in their pocket and walk off with it. <laughs> so that may be the case, too. Um, this letter is going to provide some guidelines on that relationship. Uh, he's probably a thief. <laughs> And he probably does, does all this stuff as an unsaved man in the house as a servant. Uh, look at verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. He's saying, when he was with you, he wasn't saved. But now he's saved. He's in the Lord. So there's something that has changed. You won't be getting back the same guy that walked off and probably put something in his pocket when he walked off. <laughs> It'll be somebody different. Now, look at verse 5. Verse 5, he says, Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Okay, that's the proper, that's the proper order of things. Love is toward the Lord Jesus Christ first, then toward the saints. You can't get the order wrong. If you love the saints more than you love Jesus Christ, the order is an inordinate affection, is how the Bible puts it. There are two commandments that Jesus gave them and enumerated them. He said, this is the first commandment, and here's the second commandment. Same order. Love God and your neighbor. And he tells you this one's first and this one's second. And if you get that order wrong, then you've told him, I don't like your order, I'll make my own. And that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, people get into trouble when they switch those two. Loving God is manifest. You can tell the person that loves God. Not that we're running around with a notepad taking note of <laughs> who's a good lover of God and who's not. And, you know, I, I don't like the way you're acting. And <laughs> We're not the hall monitor. However, it just becomes apparent. Look at John 14. John 14, verse 15. John 14, verse 15. Jesus speaking, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> okay, a person that keeps his commandments, that obeys the Lord, is the one who loves him. Now, you may, uh, you may like and admire some things about God, but if you don't obey the things he says to do, you don't truly love him. You like the idea of him. Look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If man love me, he will keep my... What's that? Words, plural. That means somewhere, every single word is recorded. It's words plural, not word singular. Word singular would be the idea. Words plural means the exact speech word for word. If you don't have those, then you cannot fulfill that verse. 
And he's saying a man can and should. Therefore, we must have it. And I've got it in my hand. Uh, and, and my father will love him and will come unto him and, make, and, we will make our, and come unto him and make our abode with him. This tells you something about this relationship. People think God loves everybody. And in a sense, that's true. To, to, a, to a degree, he does. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I know that love is past tense. However, the action of that love is still permeating now. So even though it happened in the past tense, it's still available right now. It didn't run out. So he loves them in their potential, not in their current situation. So the, the thing is here he's saying somebody can get more of our love than other people. He says, if you'll keep my words, we'll do something special for you. We'll come make our abode with him. Hmm. So that's something special. Uh, a modern Christian who wants to get a Bible they're comfortable with or one that they can critique makes themselves God, and God's not going to come make his abode with anybody like that. Because they are their own God. And God will honor us sticking to what he says and not trying to make up something on our own. And that's really easy to get into. Because even as a Christian, you'll think, there's, there's certain things I want the Bible to say. <laughs> you know, I want it to say, thou shalt go to church on Sunday night, and it doesn't. Well, let's infer it. No, you can't do that. <laughs> Okay, stick with write what it says. Don't make anything else up. Look at verse 6. Uh, Philemon, verse 6. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, people ignore that verse, but that's a very good verse. That verse is saying there's a whole bunch of good stuff in you. Now, that sounds like a modernist, doesn't it? But it's not. Because if Jesus Christ is in you, you can't get any more gooder. <laughs> and that goodness is within you. That's verse 6. Now, the communication of thy faith may become effectual. Sometimes it's hard to, um, to relate, to communicate, to get your message across to people. Because we all think a little different. And the fact of the matter is this. The more Bible you get in you, the more of a sound mind you get. So if you go out here and you're dealing with people that don't have anything to do with the Bible, their mind's already half shot. It's going to take some work. So this is what he's praying about, that the communication of your faith can become effectual. And that's what we want. He says the way it's going to become effectual is by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Therefore, when somebody says... You did a good job on that. You say, no, the good was Jesus Christ showed it to me. He helped me with it. Uh, he enabled me. Okay, that's acknowledging the good that's in you. The only good that's in you is Jesus Christ. And that's making that uh, become communicated. Um, look at uh, Galatians 6. He talked about the communication of thy faith. The communication means both verbal and nonverbal. Uh, one way that it's communicated by this man, of course, was he was hosting the church in his own home. And so that was his hospitality. Um, Galatians 6, verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That communication is not saying sit down and carry on a conversation with him. Although you should do that anyway. But it's saying communicate that is, give to his needs. Make sure that he's taken care of because he's taking care of you spiritually. Um, and, of course, in prayer, that's definitely what you want to do. You want to remember them in prayer. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians 9, verse 7. Paul was allowed to do some things that he did not do, but that didn't change the rules. <laughs> and Paul comes in, and people will, will notice. He says, um, I, 
I preach the gospel free of charge. And people will say, okay, because he did that, then every preacher should. No, he taught that they shouldn't. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7, Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Okay, you're going to be a soldier? Do you do that at your own expense? Now, in the Civil War, the, the smart generals, and even all the way back into the Revolutionary War, that was what turned Benedict Arnold off, was they had to pay their own men out of their own pocket because there wasn't any government money. So to keep their men and support them, and they've had families at home that needed things, it was the rich men who were the generals, and they would pay out of their own pocket. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Paul recognizes it here. Who planteth a vineyard and needeth not of the fruit thereof? Well, I, that's half the fun of it. <laughs> or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the, uh, muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. That is when the, when the ox is going around there and the pestle is turning and they're making big corn into little corn, <laughs> corn, corn meal. You don't muzzle the ox. So when he gets hungry, he can reach over there and get him a handful. And eat, well, I guess they don't have hands, do they? A mouthful. <laughs> and eat. That keeps his calories up. That helps him work. You know, he's going to keep his stamina. And you're benefiting from it. He ought to benefit from it too. Or saith, verse 10, Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partakers of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So that's that communication he's talking about. And that's what Philemon had been doing. He'd been very hospitable. We saw that in the beginning of the chapter all the way up to, where are we now, verse 6. Look at uh, Philippians 4, verse 14. First, uh, not first, Philippians, Philippians. Got too many books we're going to tonight. <laughs> Philippians 4, verse 14. Notwithstanding, you have done well. You have well done. <laughs> That's why I like my steak. You have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Okay, that didn't mean that you got the, the, um, the guard on the phone and talked to him, had a conversation with him. It means when I was being afflicted, you brought me something. You brought some goodies to me. He called that communication. Look at uh, verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. That's defining communication. So communication's got a couple of definitions in the Bible. One of them is verbal, and one is nonverbal in giving and uh, meeting people's needs. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 6. First Timothy 6, verse 18. Talking to rich people. We don't have any of those, but it's nice to read about them. <laughs> First Timothy 6, verse 18. That they do good, that they, uh, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to, there's our word, communicate. Okay, distributing is communicating. And it's not always the same place the way this thing is supposed to work, churches have messed it up because churches have gotten so big that they demand all your money and you've got to dump it all in here. Well, then you don't have the, the joy of God moving on you and saying, hey, there's somebody over there that needs something. And you can go do that and you get a blessing out of that. But when you just dump it in the plate every time and you don't see where that money is going and you, you kind of miss out on the blessing. Now, you should do that, too. I'm not saying that. But there should be a communication between you and the Holy Spirit where he's saying, hey, there's a need over there. I'll let you have an extra dollar yesterday, so go get that. Was, that wasn't for you. That was for that man over there. And that's good. And Paul emphasizes that over and over. Look at, uh, back to our passage, Philemon 1. Philemon 1, verse 7. 
He says, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love. He's going to define it. Because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. He said, people get a full belly <laughs> when they visit you. And that's an exhibition of your love. Okay, he fed them. Kim's good one about that. <laughs> she cooks enough for three armies. <laughs> Those bows are, um, in the Bible, bows means your internals. Not necessarily any one part, but just the inside of you, your, your whole being. Um, when you're hungry, when you're starving, it affects you more than just your belly. It starts affecting your mind. You can't think straight. Uh, your blood sugar gets off. I mean, a lot of things are affected by that. So he's talking about when you get that back, get your belly full again, you can think again, your blood sugar's back on level, you know, it relaxes a lot of things on the internal besides just your belly. So he calls it bowels. Look at verse 8. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, uh, that which is convenient. Okay, there's several things um, in Paul's ministry that he had the right to do and he did not do. Um, he says, I've got the right to boldly command you to do something, but I'm not going to do it that way. And that's the tone of this letter. The tone of this letter is, hey, I've got something I want to ask you to do. I'm not requiring it of you, although you owe me your life. However, <laughs> However, I would rather you just do this of your own free will. Hint, hint, this is what I want for Christmas. <laughs> and that's kind of the tone we're getting here. Um, he had the right to get married, and he didn't choose that. 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5. Paul's saying, I've been traveling around here all by myself, uh, supporting myself. You know, picking up whoever wants to go and helping them and telling the sissies to go back home. <laughs> Don't slow me down. <laughs> First Corinthians 9, verse 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as, and as the brethren of our Lord and uh, Cephas? He's saying there, he had the right to have a wife that traveled on the mission field with him. But he wasn't using that right. You know what that right would have entailed? He would have had to have double support. <laughs> and he couldn't move as fast. A lot of things would have been held up by that. However, he's saying, Cephas does it. Paul's got a wife. And others do. It's, it's legal. There's a right to do it. I've got the right, but I'm not using that right. So just because somebody doesn't use a right doesn't make that the law. And so he's trying to remind this guy, I have the right to command you to do something, but I'm not doing that right now. <laughs> so go do it before I do. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to go through all the rights. You can get the notes and find those. Philemon's verse 10. Philemon verse 10. Philemon, verse 10, I beseech ye uh, for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now, this is a verse that causes trouble. <laughs> he says some things there. Okay, this servant that ran away, he's not saying it's literally his son. He's saying that the relationship is like father and son, and then he explains why. Whom I have begotten in my bonds. Okay. So in that relationship in prison, uh, somehow he met him. This guy probably got put in jail alongside of him because he's a thief. Um, he probably stole something over there in Rome and got thrown in next to Paul. <laughs> and maybe he's out now. And so he says, he's begotten in my bonds, meaning while I was in here, something happened and he got saved. So in that regard, he's a son. Um, 
he uses this same phrase with other men so we can understand what he's talking about. Look at 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy 1, verse 2. You can look at this thing and think, wait a minute. Jesus said, call no man on earth your father, right? And yet Paul is claiming to be the father, begotten, this person right here. And he does it again right here, 1 Timothy 1, verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, seems like he's doing it there. Let's find another time. Titus chapter 1, verse 4. Unto Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Okay, so the new birth is what he's talking about, and Paul doesn't birth anybody. The Holy Spirit's got to do that, because it's a spiritual birth. Paul can't do that. Now, he can facilitate it. He can be the nurse. <laughs> he can be the one on hand that delivers you. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. This is the verse that clears it up. 1 Corinthians 4.15 For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, and we do, or we should, you listen to them, we've got a million of them you can get on the radio, you should have books of them, I mean, other Christians are instructing you. Instruction is just galore. He says you've got 10,000 instructors in Christ. Yet have you not many fathers? How many fathers can you have? One? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Okay, so what he's talking about here is he's begot, I have begotten you through the gospel. It's the gospel that begot you. But that's, um, he's the one that brought you to Christ. And only one person's responsible for that. Now many people may lend a hand, but only one person is there in the delivery room when you get saved. Um, that's the way he's wording it. Um, Paul could have used this title as father and he almost does many times <laughs> the, the, the Catholics use it not as a term of I've done the work and I was there when you got saved because they don't believe in that <laughs> they want to institutionalize the phrase father is for a group of people and it's institutionalized the archbishop can declare who's a father and who's not. Okay, that's not biblical. Biblical, you do some work to become a father. To be a father requires some work. And we got a bunch of deadbeat ones that shouldn't be called fathers nowadays. Um, in Matthew 23 is that, Matthew 23, 9, where he says, call no man on earth your father. And that's a fact. As far as the instructors, now this is where it gets dangerous. People love titles. <laughs> titles don't mean anything. Because it's not me that's getting honored. It's all the Word of God. If I'm giving out the Word of God, that's great. Y'all enjoy it. And God gets the praise for it. Because you're in all of His Word, not me. Mm -hmm. um, so that if you start giving the instructor, He said you got 10,000 instructors. If you start giving them all these big phony titles... <laughs> Then it institutionalizes men, and it becomes a scholastical thing, a worldly thing, you know, like a college. You have professors, and you've got, you know, tenured professors, and, you know, all that the hierarchy there. Well, that's not what's supposed to go on in the, in the church. The thing that goes on nowadays is this title, doctor. <laughs> and... Most doctors are not doctors. It's a phony doctorate. It's called a honorary doctorate. <laughs> We're not supposed to be carrying around titles as though that's going to give you um, a right to be heard. 
the thing that gives us the right to be heard is Jesus Christ said, you're going to be a minister, and your ministry is reconciliation. And he didn't just give it to one person, he gave it to everybody. If you're saved, that's your ministry. You're called, and we could all wear the title of ambassador of reconciliation. <laughs> we could put that behind our name. <laughs> Look at verse 11, uh, Philemon 1, verse 11. Now he's talking about this servant that's run away, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Well, he doesn't have any proof of that. <laughs> he's got faith in this guy, though. He's saying, I I've spent some time with him. I know him. He's not profitable. He wasn't profitable to you when he was there putting things in his pocket. But now he's going to be profitable to you. He's been profitable to me. Meaning that he's met Paul's needs, and he's probably, you know, if you're put in jail there in a foreign country, um, or a country where you don't know many people, just having somebody come along and talk to you would be a help. <laughs> just another friendly voice, that'd be a nice thing. He says, this guy will be profitable for you. Um, Onesimus, the name means profitable. So maybe he's using a play on words here. Because before, Onesimus definitely wasn't profitable. But now the only way he can be profitable is to be put into the Lord. You're not going to do anybody any good if you're not saved and Christ doesn't do anything through you. An unsaved person cannot do you good. I know that sounds crazy, but they can't. Their, whatever good thing they seem to do is very temporary. When God talks about good, he talks about something that extends for eternity. A lost man doesn't know anything about that. So here he's saying this man can now be profitable because he understands eternal things. Look at verse 18. This is, I think this, this first word, if, is almost sarcastic. He knows the story, but he's acting like he doesn't know all the gory details. If he hath wronged thee, or owe thee aught, put that on my account. <laughs> in other words, Paul's saying, just get over it. I mean, face it, he's in jail. What good would it do to build an account with the, the man that's in jail? <laughs> he doesn't have anything. <laughs> he knows that the guy's been doing him wrong. But he's, he's going to go on in a minute, and he's going to tell, tell him that you owe me your own life. And so, you know, this is a small thing for me to require of you. Even though I'm not requiring it. Hint, hint, go do it. <laughs> Look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So because of that, Paul can say, you know, there's not much hope in people changing. Just by and large, people don't change. The only thing that can change a man is the maker of the man. And when God makes you a new creature, old things can suddenly be gone and new come. But an unsaved person... If he's been a drunk in the past, chances are he'll go back to it. Or he'll always fight it. And there's always a chance he'll slip back in. Whatever was his past, Paul gives you a list of things, such were some of you. And those are the propensities of the flesh. And those things will haunt a man. However, if he gets saved, he can be a new creature in Christ Jesus. And those things get thrown away. That's the thing I do not like about AA. AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, they have you come in and I pulled a dirty trick. When I was, when I was uh, just out of high school, I uh, was a sign language interpreter for AA classes at St. Jude Hospital in Memphis for the deaf. And of course, nobody knows what you're doing because you're doing sign language. So I'd go in there and change all the curriculum. It's all about higher power and all that. I'll just preach to them. <laughs> they didn't know. But that's what AA does. They want you to, 
to admit that you are a drunk and you never leave that. You're always in recovery. Not if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. You just picked up something you shouldn't have. It isn't who you are. For an unsaved person, it's who they are. That soul's connected to the flesh. Once you're saved, it's cut free. You're not identified by the sins of the flesh. Uh, okay, let's move on. Verse 14. Verse 14. Paul's trying to be nice again. <laughs> he says, But without thy mind I would do nothing that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. Okay, Paul says, I'm not going to send him back and force him on you, um, you know, if you're not agreeable to it. Um, but he's really going to anyway. <laughs> My dad used to do this. He'll, he'll be sitting at the table, and he always has a salad bowl, you know, the size of a garbage can. It <laughs> feeds the whole table. And he loves salad. I never have really cared a whole lot for salad, but um, he'll ask this question. Does anybody want any more salad? Well, that doesn't mean what it sounds like. It sounds, <laughs> it sounds like he's asking if someone would like some more and he's going to get it for them. It means I'm going to eat the rest. If you want any, you better come get it. <laughs> That's kind of what Paul's doing here. He's saying, I'm not going to do anything, you know, force it on you, but you better do this because I could force it on you. <laughs> but without thy mind would I do nothing. Um, he says that, the, that thy benefit should be as it were of not that thy benefit should be as it were of necessity but willingly now that's his ministry all all through the way every place he's been it's been i want to get you started and then leave in fact you'll find a place where he says i requested a gift from y'all not because i needed anything but because you needed the benefit of giving so you get an eternal reward he was always trying to get them started on the path, get them motivated to do something for God. And it's always the hardest thing to learn to do this, step out on faith. The first time you do it, you realize what it is. But until then, it's just a theory in a book somewhere. When you take a step and you know there is absolutely nothing there to catch you, and you do that simply because... You know that's what God requires, and you're going to do it, period. There's no, there's no ground there. You're just stepping. And he puts ground under it. Then you're hooked. Should be. <laughs> then you should know what it is. At least the next time you come up to it, you'll be like, oh, we've been here before. I hated doing that step, but uh, I know I got to. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what Paul's doing. Hey, I want you to get this good thing spiritually you need to take this next step and it's going to be for your good you're not going to like it but do it anyway <laughs> he's trying to encourage them look at first corinthians 9 first corinthians 9 verse 17 paul is talking about preaching the gospel he says for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What he's talking about here is there's some things you can do of your own free will that you get a blessing for. And there's some things that if you're just doing it to be obedient, it may be safe for you, but you don't get the extra reward. For instance, this is... This is so dangerous. I, I hate to keep using this example, but it's a simple one that I don't like that people do. If I come in and say, it's required that you give 10% to church. Okay, I've just lied to you. It's not required in the New Testament anywhere. You can't get a verse for that. However, it is required that you give. You're supposed to give. Now, not necessarily to me, to somebody, somewhere, to the body the other saints. Um, and I'm not going to tell you how much. God's got to do that. They did that in the Old Testament. He said you give 10%. That's the same as your income tax because it was going to the government. Okay? So do you pay taxes? Okay, you've qualified for your 10% right there. <laughs> okay, so 
but people not knowing any different. They don't know there's not a verse in the New Testament that says that. And there is a hint of it that's true. You're supposed to give. Okay, so that part of it's true, but the percentage part's not true. And that person is doing it because the preacher told them to. And he didn't add any scripture to it. Or he mis misapplied it. Then the person is obeying the preacher, not God. It would be better if you're reading your Bible through and you say, Hey, they could give 10% in that Old Testament. There's no reason I can't either. And you and God come up with that. Then that'd be fine. You can give that 10% because it's something you and God worked out. That's what's called a free will offering. It was of your own free will. You and God worked it out. Not you obeying me. I can't. When we get to heaven, I can't say, Oh, I've got some extra rewards here for everybody who tithes. I won't have any. There's only one person handing out rewards in heaven. And it ain't me. It's going to be Jesus Christ. Look at verse 15. Verse 15, Philemon, verse 15. For perhaps <clears throat> he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. <laughs> Paul's really laying it on thick here. <clears throat> he said he was a servant. Uh, he stole some stuff from me and he ran away. But hey, he's a great guy now. I want you to bring him back. And I'm almost going to command this, but I, I, it's good for you just to go ahead and say you want to do it. And when you get him back, he'll be a servant forever. Maybe he didn't want to be a servant forever. <laughs> he says he'll be a servant forever. Now, that means one of two things. It doesn't mean in eternity that Onesimus is going to be a servant <laughs> to Philemon the rest of his uh, eternity. Not necessarily. It means that things have changed, and if he will treat him the way that a master is supposed to treat a servant, he's a new creature in Christ Jesus, and the relationship will be different. And it will. Uh, it also means that um, he's going to be different now that he's saved. And so in eternity, he'll see him in eternity. They'll be together again in eternity. Now, that's not saying the position will be the same in eternity. Probably not. They'll probably be the same in eternity. Uh, look at verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. Hmm. So, not only does he have to take this thief back into his home, but he can't give him the title servant anymore. <laughs> Above a servant. Give him a raise. <laughs> a brother beloved, especially to me. <laughs> but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. He's saying... Somebody who's saved can benefit you on both sides, physically and spiritually. Now, a lost person could benefit you physically in this life. Um, and a lot of times, God will force the lost world to help his, his children. Um, I get electric from a bunch of lost people. I don't know anybody down at Gulf Power. Probably 90% of them are lost. Well, they're helping me get electric. <laughs> I'm getting a benefit out of that. That's the way God works. He says he'll benefit you physically, and he's going to help him in the house. He's going to do some chores. But he's also going to be there spiritually. If he will, as a master, help him grow spiritually, they benefit each other in eternity. They can each get some rewards. He'll get a reward for going back and submitting. If this guy will teach him, like Paul's been teaching him the Bible, then he'll get a reward in eternity. The two of them will benefit each other back and forth. Um, and I've got too much here. Uh, we've been an hour already. Uh, let's just drop right down to... Um, all right, let's go to verse 23. Therefore salute Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in, in uh, Christ Jesus. Epaphras is um, Epaphroditus. You'll find him again mentioned in several books. Um, and he's called a fellow servant, a fellow prisoner. So in this life, we get many titles that don't really mean a whole lot. The thing you can add to whatever the world adds your title to, you know, servant, um, rookie, <laughs> you can add that title, take that title and add in Christ Jesus to it. And it suddenly means a thousand times more. 
here are these fellow prisoners in Christ. Okay, well, that's a whole different category. A fellow laborer in Christ, well, that means a whole lot more than just a laborer. And you see that over and over. Uh, one other person that's important to see is verse 24. And Marcus. Okay, Marcus is, you'll notice some names in there. Marcus is John Mark. Uh, and Demas, you know Demas, hath forsaken me. Lucas, that's Luke. He followed, he's the writer of the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke. Um, but this Marcus here, that's probably the writer of the book of Mark. And it's John Mark with whom Paul had a real sharp dispute. <laughs> Mark went on a mission trip with him. And about halfway through, he said, man, this is too much. You're, you're just requiring too much of me. <laughs> he said, I got to go back home and take a siesta. And he turned back from the ministry. Well, Paul let him go. Second time around, they're ready to pack things up, take the second mission trip. And here comes John Mark. He wants to go again. And Paul says, no going. I don't have time to hold hands and, you know, wash baby diapers and all that stuff. It's over. <laughs> so they had a split right there. Well, they got that thing fixed up because either he did some growing <laughs> or maybe Paul learned some more grace and mercy. I don't know. <laughs> Probably both. That's right. But now he's helpful. He's a fellow laborer. And this shows you that um, you never really blow it with God. If you're willing to get it right, it can be gotten right. Here the book is about a servant who's been exalted to more than a servant, a brother in Christ. And it ends with John Mark, my fellow laborer. Well, John Mark was a loser to begin with, but he's not anymore. And I like that this is the last book that closes out the church age. Because that's what we end up with at the end of the church age is a bunch of losers. <laughs> However, you don't have to finish as a loser. Anybody can get right with God and keep on going. God's got something that man doesn't know anything about. He's got a whiteout that is beyond any human. He's got blood. You know, when a human gets a drop of blood on something, it stains, and it's almost impossible to get that stain out. We know, because I mean, you cut yourself all the time at doing upholstery, and you get that blood on something, it's tough to get out. Well, there's something worse that stains, and it's called sin. And either a Christian or a lost person can get that stain on something. Jesus says, I've got blood that'll wash that stain out and make it white as snow. That's available for a Christian. In 1 John, he says, if we confess our sins, that's that thing that stains, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.